When I wrote The Way of the Warrior, I was grappling with one universal question. Can humanity ever come to know peace? The world rages in war because there's a war that rages within us. How do we come to world peace? It can only be answered in one way. The world will never know peace until we know peace. The Way of the Warrior is a battle for peace. And the struggle is completely within us. Yes, so this morning we're kicking off a brand new series called Way of the Warrior. In fact, it's the book from Irwin and it's a great read as well. So I want you to consider making this a summer read because we're, this is going to be our summer series. And this morning you got a treat. We've got our very own Amber Cavazos who's be kicking us off uh, first week, week one with the series. And next week I'll be there. But uh, let's give her a hand. She is loved by so many. She's amazing. So can we do that? Can we just go crazy for her? Let's give her a hand as she comes on up. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Good morning. Good morning. Y'all are awesome. Gracious me. Good morning. I'm so happy to be here today. You know what? I have been treated like a guest in my own home. Wouldn't you love that? Like just go home and people are like, what can I do for you? That's how it's been this morning. I love it. I'm getting the Naeem Fossil treatment and I don't mind it, it's been awesome. So I'm super grateful to be here today to uh, be able to speak to you in a place where we call home. Um, my family and I have been here for four years now, time is flying. Um, we are so happy to be at Mosaic and just God's way of bringing us here has been wonderful. I do wanna show you those people that I live with because you don't often see us together, in fact, some of you are going to say, who's that? They go together? What? Um, there are five of us in our home. We all do live in the same house. We sleep there at night. That might be the extent of the time that we are at home at this point in our lives. I have an 18-year-old graduate, which is crazy. He's cut his hair since then, so just so you know, you might not recognize him. Then at my middle is Brielle Sabrina. She's 16 years old, running all the things of the world and trying to run our home, but we are staying strong, all right? Then we have Bryson Taylor, who is 14 years old. Bryson is almost, well, he's about to be a high schooler, which is crazy to me, and he would claim probably to be the master at Fortnite. If any of you have teenagers... You know what that's all about, all right? Um, I am excited to kick off this series, um, The Way of a Warrior. And it's exciting because I think we always need a reminder that we are in a war. You know, some of us may say, well, I signed up for the Christianity thing, but war? What you talking about? I signed up for the Jesus loves me, and I love him, and I love his people, and everything's awesome, right? You ready for that kind of Christianity? Yeah, bring it, I'll take it. I wish I could tell you it was always like that, right? The reality is we have an enemy of our souls that has been warring against you, warring against a lot of things within you, and quite frankly wants to destroy your life. I'm sorry that I don't have like gifts of cake and roses and rainbows and unicorns today. Um, that is just truth. Um, sometimes things may happen in your life and you're like, why is this happening? The Bible reminds us in Ephesians chapter 6 that we are in this war. It says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. I'm giving you a different version, so sorry, I'll stick with it. So that you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. The chapter that I'm doing today is the warrior fights only for peace. Um, those seem opposite, don't they? Why are we fighting for peace? But when it comes to our inner peace, can I just tell you before we dive into this, it's worth the fight. Do you believe that? It's worth the fight. 
And a lot of times the thing, the person trying to strangle your peace from you has nothing to do with humans that live with you or work next to you or go to school with you or do anything with you. A lot of it has to do with Satan and what he's doing. When you think of peace, what do you think of? What visions come to your mind? Some of you might be in Hawaii. Some of you might be traveling the world in your mind right now when I say the word peace. Some of you might be laying on a massage table, bring it, right? Some of you may have just a day of silence. Nobody's talking to you. Nobody's demanding anything of you, right? But if we can bring peace into the real world, at least my world, what does that look like for you? It could look like kids being completely silent. Now, I tell you what, this is my husband's version of peace in our home. He's like, if everybody can just chill it, quiet it down, let's eat something, let's watch something, and be at peace. That would be awesome. Uh, The next one could be maybe you just want to get out of your real world and get into a pretend world. Maybe you want to shut out what's happening, what you hear, what you see. This is Bryson's version of peace, and we just have to pull him out of that room and off that computer and snatch the headset off because he enjoys this world that really isn't our reality. Maybe for some of you, it was a different season of life. Maybe it was a couple of decades ago, and you said, you know what? I like that version of peace. Jesus, take me back there, wherever there is for you. Maybe it's just being cool. All is right in your world. My friends love me. Doing what I want to do. Life is good. For some of us, peace is found in the comfort of a person. And we expect that person to be the author and the finisher of our peace. And it's just not fair, is it? It's just not fair. I did have to threaten my family to do these pictures for me. Um, They're still alive. I think they're all here. But what I wanted us to do is think of what does peace mean to you? What does it mean to you? This is how it's defined in the dictionary. Freedom from disturbance, tranquility, calm, restfulness, Peace and quiet, stillness. I love this word, noiselessness. It's a lot of letters. Noiselessness. Um, Erwin McManus says this, The peace we seek must come from within. And this, you will discover, is the greatest of all battles. There will never be peace on earth until there is peace within us. An inner peace that is free of worry. Woo, that's crazy, right? Free of fear. How in the world do we get there? Could this be the kind of peace that Jesus described in John 14, chapter 27? I'm sorry, chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus said, I am leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give isn't fragile like the peace the world gives, so don't be troubled or afraid. Could Jesus actually be saying that the peace that he has promised us is different than the peace we think of? I think the answer to that is yes. Because Jesus is promising me peace in my house, and my house is not free of noise. He's promising me peace in our world, and our world is not free of war. He's he's asking and promising me peace in a world that is so unstable. So how in the world do we get peace in the midst of things like that? Either Jesus lied, or he had a different definition. The Bible says he's not a liar, all right? So he has a different definition. In Hebrew, this is what peace means. This is what Jesus said. He said, I want you to be complete and sound. People say the word shalom, which is peace in Hebrew, and what they are blessing you with is wholeness of life and body. It does sometimes look like right relationship between two parties, 
Sometimes it looks like you are at peace with everybody in your world. Sometimes it is, it might be success or fulfillment in life. Sometimes it is victory over war. So what did Jesus promise? Did he promise that our world would be perfect? He did not. But what he did promise is that inside of amber can be at peace. Inside of amber can be whole. Inside of you, you can feel complete and have a sound mind. Unfortunately, all of the wars are not stopping right now so that I can look around me and say, oh my gosh, there's peace everywhere I turn. There's just peace. It's not happening that way, unfortunately. I wish it would. I love this song. I think we sang it last week that says, the wind and the waves still know his name. They still know his name. And I know all of you have had the experience where everything may seem like it's going well around you, but inside of you there is wind and there are waves, and you're saying, Jesus, I need you to calm the storm inside of me. When Jesus said, peace I give you, that's the kind of peace that he wants to give. Um, When I think about a story in the Bible that talks about peace and crazy and a person I can just relate to, I think of Jacob in the Old Testament. You guys know Jacob? You know, when they prayed in the Old Testament, they would say um, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob has several chapters in the book of Genesis, and his life honestly reads like, a bestseller, honestly, like you should check him out, all right? He is an interesting character, yet God blesses him. And I don't exactly understand how that works, but God blesses his life. Genesis 27 tells us that he was a twin. He had a twin named Esau, and Esau was actually the bigger, burlier version of the set of twins. And Jacob finds a way to deceive and sneak and steal his birthright. Okay, then after that, with the help of his mother, who clearly was an expert in deceit as well, they figured out how to take the blessing too. I mean, they went through all kinds of things. You all remember this story? They put hair, fake hair on him so that he felt hairy like Esau. They did all kinds of stuff. They pretended that Jacob went and hunted something and they fed Isaac, right? They went through all of this stuff just to deceive. So Jacob has this life of stealing and deceiving people. So his mother realizes, you know what? Esau's a little bit upset with you, just a little. You've taken his birthright, you took the blessing, you've taken it all. You probably should run away. So she sends him to his uncle Laban. Well, guess what Jacob finds? Uncle Uncle Laban is also a master at deception. And he spends so many years deceiving Jacob. You kind of reap what you sow, right? It happens. Even in the midst of deceit and lies, and Jacob works for seven years for the girl that he loves, Rachel, who's so beautiful. And then he finds out on his wedding night, this isn't Rachel, this is Leah, the lesser of the two in his mind. But now they're married. So then he wants, he wants his girl. He wants his girl. So he's like, I'll work another seven years. Okay, and so he ends up being blessed, having wives, having cattle, and having all of these things. In Genesis 30, verse 43, it says this, As a result, Jacob became very wealthy with large flocks of sheep and goats, female and male servants, and many camels and donkeys. But Jacob soon learned that Laban's sons were grumbling about him. Jacob has robbed our father of everything, they said. He has gained all of the wealth at at our father's expense. And Jacob began to notice a change in Laban's attitude toward him. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your father and grandfather and to your relatives there, and I will be with you. Jacob had all of the things that this world would say should bring you peace. He had the wives, he had the cattle, he was rich as far as that culture 
was concerned. He had fulfillment and success. Yet inside of him, there was a wrestle. He was not at peace. So what can we learn from this moment in Jacob's life? Number one, observe and evaluate your peace. Is it true peace or is it a false peace? Is it the kind of peace that on the outside somebody says, oh my goodness, they are doing amazing. They look good. They have a great job. They have great friends. They have a great church community. Their health is perfect. They look great. What kind of peace do you have within you? Is there a wrestle? Is it the peace that Jesus defines, or is it the peace that our world defines? I think God wants to give us the peace that is eternal, not the peace that is temporary, not the peace that is tossed when things get crazy, not the peace that walks away in the midst of hardship. There's a quote from Irwin's book, and it says, Peace does not come because you finally have control over your life. Peace comes when you no longer need control. The peace that culture gives us, we gather things, we do things, we work hard, we find the right person, we put ourselves in the right places, and then we say, oh, success is mine, I earned it, I did the work, I put in the time, I sowed good seed, and here I am. The peace that Jesus wants to give us is not something we work for. It's not something that we control. It is something that he just wants to give us. You know, the Bible talks about us being strangers in our land and in our world, and nobody is, like, trying to sign up for that, right? Nobody wants to be strange. Who wants to be strange, right? Who wants to be the people that someone's looking at and pointing at? But Jesus wasn't talking about in the way we dress or in what we do and all of that. He was talking about what's going on on the inside of us. We should be different because peace is not defined by this world. It's defined by Jesus Christ. And so we live at a different standard. I can have everything in the world or I can have nothing, but my heart can be at peace. And that's what Jesus wants to give us. So Genesis 32, verses 6 through 1 says this. Oh, let me give you a little, okay? So Jacob is like all a mess inside. I don't like what Laban's doing to me. I got to go back. Well, if he goes back, who is he facing? Esau. Esau said in part of the scripture that when his father died and after he mourned him, he was going to kill Jacob. So that's what he's going back to. He's going back to Uh, threat on his life, okay? So he has to go back there, and he knows this. He knows what he's done. So he sends messengers ahead, which is kind of smart. So he, after delivering the message, the messengers returned to Jacob and reported, we met your brother Esau, and he's already on his way to meet you with an army of 400 men. Okay, so Jacob had gathered his wives and his cattle and his servants. He wasn't gathering like army men, okay? But Esau was coming with 400 men. Welcome home, Jacob, okay? So Jacob was terrified at the news. I would be too. He divided his household along the flocks and herds and camels into two groups, and he thought if Esau meets one group and he attacks it, perhaps the other can escape. So we are seeing in Jacob how his peace is also, it's just threatened a little more. Now we've got fear. Now we've got worry. He thinks he's going to die. So he's being strategic. He is trying to figure out how can I get to having peace inside as well as this life that I want to live. Number two, commit to the process even when it's hard. What will it cost you to get inner peace? What will it cost you, and are you willing to give it? Sometimes, most of the time, we don't want to go back in our history. Because when we go back in our history, sometimes we find things that we did that we don't want to talk about. We find a person that is just different than who we are today. Jacob had to go back and face the liar, the sneak, the deceiver when he went home. But he was willing to do it. 
You know, I don't think Jesus is asking us to go in unequipped into our past and be like, I got this. That's arrogance, total arrogance. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus wants to equip us to go back, face our past, and get the inner peace. What are we willing to do? What are we willing to do to get the peace that God has for us? Um, When Jacob went to his brother, he went and presented these gifts, and he presented 200 female goats. I am not a farmer. I don't need goats, but apparently they needed goats. Um, 20 male goats. There were camels, all kinds of stuff, and he was saying, here, take this. I'm willing to give it. I'm willing to do the hard thing to get to the peace that God has for me. What is the hard thing that God's asking you to do? What is he asking you to look back on? And he wants to say, I'm equipping you. I'm giving you power. I'm giving you confidence. I'm giving you the resources. I'm giving you the people in your life so that you can face that thing and conquer it. Because inner peace doesn't come when we choose to shut off parts of our lives inside our hearts, does it? It doesn't work. Y'all can talk to me. I'm all right with that. All right? It doesn't work. What happens is you end up like Jacob, and you're like, I have it all on the outside, but inside, I'm a complete mess. I'm a complete mess. What are you willing to give? What are you willing to do? Now, my profession happens to be pastor and all of that, but I know a therapist, a good one. And the reason I'm saying that is because when we go back in our past, there are some things the Holy Spirit wants to do and make whole in you. But it's completely okay if you need a therapist to help you process that. Because for some of us, inner peace is not going to happen until we go there. So whatever the fear, the worry, what is it surrounding? What is it surrounding? Allow God to highlight it, to pinpoint it, and say, you know what? I'm anointing you to walk through this thing. I'm going to give you the people you need. I want you to come to me and get it. Okay? When we don't want to go back when we don't want to go back, when we realize we can't go back in ourselves, that's when God can move in and do what he does best because that's humility. And that's saying, God, I can't do this by myself. I can't. I need you. And he loves, absolutely loves those moments. Um, When we skip ahead to Genesis 33, verses 3 and 4, we find out that the worry and the stress that Jacob had was unnecessary. It says, Then Jacob went ahead. As he approached his brother, he bowed to the ground seven times before him. Then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they both wept. The Bible tells us that they made a treaty And Jacob's like, here, I have all this stuff for you. And Esau's like, keep your stuff. I have my own stuff. I'm just happy that you're here. I'm just happy that you're here. I forgive you and all your mess. I'm just happy that you're here. I love that Jacob was committed to the process, even when it was hard, even when it cost him something. Because in this particular season of his life, he found an inner peace that was free from worry and free from fear. Fear, worry, peace do not coexist. They don't. So we have to kick out fear. We have to kick out worry to get the peace that God wants to give us. That's the only way it makes sense that the world can be crazy around us, yet inside... Your boat is calm. Your boat is still. Not oblivious. Because I think some Christians think that oblivion is spiritual, and it's not. But it's recognizing the source of my peace is not in something outside of here. It's what Jesus is doing inside of me. Let's see what happens with this dude, Jacob. 
We might not want to model our lives after Jacob, by the way, because Jacob's a little bit of a mess. Genesis 32, verses 24 through 26 says, Then Jacob was left alone in the camp, and the man came and wrestled with him until dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched out of, and it wrenched out of the socket. Then the man said, Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Number three, choose to war for the peace that God has for you. Are you willing to wrestle with God? Amber, what are you talking about? I would lose every time. God challenges us, and he does things in us, and he brings stuff up, and it feels like a wrestle, right? It feels like, oh my gosh, this is not me. Have you taken personality tests and been like, well, no, that's not me? Have you done that? You should. It's fun. Exciting. And you're just like, and that's kind of what happens when the Holy Spirit starts to shed light on garbage in your life, and you're just like, this is not me. This is not who you said I am. I sang that song on Sunday, right? The wrestle is good, though. The wrestle with God in prayer and Bible study to say, oh, my goodness, I'm doing that, but I'm saying that. I'm doing that, but I'm believing that. James says, oh, one of the most convicting verses for Amber Cavazos. James talks about blessing and cursing coming out of our mouths, and it should not be. Oh, I don't want to hear that. How do we praise the Lord on one hand and curse our brother or sister on the other? Right? That's wrestle with Jesus. Like, I don't want to see that mess. So instead of avoiding the mess, Jacob goes for it. He go, I'm just going to arm you, right? Boom, boom, they're going at it. And then this man is like, look, I got to go. People are going to see stuff. I got to go. And he's like, I'm hanging on until you bless me. Are you willing to hang on? Hang on tight. Hang on tight until God gives it to you. Until he gives it to you. It's not that we have to beg him for it. It's that he's inviting us into a process that's going to take some work. And it's going to take some denying of yourself. And it's going to take some giving up stuff and sacrifice, and that's not what we want to talk about. Because we signed up for the Christianity where Jesus loves me, and I love him, and I love the people around me, and everything is wonderful. We go to church on Sundays, and we sing my favorite song, and then work on Monday. It's fabulous. That's the Christianity I signed up for. Not the one that makes me wrestle with God. So Jacob must have needed a little bit of humility because that man injured his hip so that he always walked with a limp. Are we willing to wrestle until we have complete wholeness? Are we willing to get along with God, look at ourselves, and say, yeah, God, you're right. You're right. There's some stuff I need to do. There's some perspectives, some attitudes that need changed. And it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. But it's okay. It's okay. Genesis 33, 18 and 19 says this. Later, having traveled all the way from Paden Aram, Jacob arrived safely at this town of Shechem in the land of Canaan. There he set up camp outside the town. Jacob brought the plot of land where he camped from the family of Hamer and the father of Shechem for a hundred pieces of silver, and there he built an altar and named it El Elohi Israel. Number four, live your best life in the peace of God, even if you're limping with a hurting hip. Jacob had been through a lot. He had been through a lot. And Jacob's story continues, y'all. It, y'all should read him. He is a mess, kind of like we are, and life is a process for him, and he continually learns inner peace versus not having inner peace, and humility versus pride. He constantly learns that stuff, but in this verse, I think we find that he chooses to live that day, that season of life, and the peace that God gave him. He's like, we're going to set up shop here, family. We're here. 
We're doing this thing. We're living the life that God gave us. You know, once we've done all the work and the wrestling and all the stuff, we need to live in it. Live in this peace and be proud of it. Sometimes I think when we get in the company of people who lack peace, we want to just like meet with them and like help them feel good and all of that stuff, when really Jesus wants the peace that he's given us to be contagious. He doesn't want us to wallow in their lack of peace. He wants the peace that he's given us to go to them, right? He doesn't want us to be like, yeah, I'm that same way. When you're not, you're just trying to relate. No, because there's a hope and a peace. There should be a hope and a peace inside of Amber Cavazos that's different than people that don't know Jesus. Because I've wrestled. Because I've done the thing. I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. I've given up control. And I've said, Jesus, you get to drive this ship called Amber's life. McManus says, so then the journey for peace begins within our hearts. This is why we must face our fears, stand in our pain, and walk courageously in the uncertainty and mystery of a better future. Jacob was dissatisfied with his current situation, but when he did the work, it changed his future. When we become dissatisfied with a false sense of peace, we're willing to do the work, we're willing to pursue the kind of peace Jesus wants to give us, it makes our future bright. It changes things. Goodness, 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 Jacob. Jacob, good grief. I wish I could tell you all his things. I wish I could. Only so that you know he wasn't perfect. This was one moment in time when he made some right decisions, which is kind of like us, right? There's a moment in time, there's a season in time, we make some right decisions. There's a moment in time, there's a season in time where we make some bad decisions. But the thing that's important is that God was with him. God was with him. And he would listen. He would listen and do what God asked him to do. Not only can you know peace, but you can also be at peace. And while the world around you rages, the world within you can know a strange stillness and unexpected calm. How many of you would say yes to that kind of peace? Yes, I would want that, right? Jesus wants to bring that to our hearts. For some of us, you may not have ever said to Jesus, you know what? I'm surrendering my whole life to you right now. I'm giving it all. I don't want to be in control. If you haven't said that, that's where the peace begins. For some of us, I think we go on that, this process of peace and then we get distracted. I'm a very distractible person. We get distracted and we need to figure out what redefined my peace. What decided that peace is all this stuff on the outside having nothing to do with Jesus Christ? We need to evaluate those things, right? And ask God to renew, one, our definition and give us strength to pursue the right kind of peace. All right, will you stand with me? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you are our peace. Your word says that you are our peace who has broken down every wall. God, you have said to us that you want to be close to us. You have told us when we draw close to you, you will draw close to us. God, you have promised wholeness and completeness. And we are asking for that today. God, for those who do not know you, we pray, Lord God, that they would surrender in this moment to the peace that only you can give. God, the peace that is strong and stable even when the world around us is raging. It's a peace knowing that our lives belong to you, creator of all. 
and that your plans for us are great. So God, for those in this room who are in that place, I pray that you would speak to them now, that they would surrender everything. God, and for those of us who have been allowing our peace to be defined by this world, by somebody around us, maybe the person who writes our checks, maybe the people we live with, maybe our pursuit of a career. God, I pray that you would forgive us for that and help us, Lord, to seek your face. Help us, God, to be willing to wrestle a little bit and do the hard stuff and give up stuff we don't want to give up in order to have true peace in our hearts. God, I pray that we would be known as a people of peace. That when the world is raging, when we hear crazy things in the news, that people would come to us and say, what in the world is different about you? God, that's only something your spirit can do. And I pray you would do that. In Jesus' name, amen.